Francisco. I'm the director of the California Trade Justice Coalition. We're a coalition of labor, environmental, and human rights organizations who all work together to push for people-driven rather than corporate-driven trade deals. Um, so we're here to talk about NAFTA, or the North American Free Trade Agreement. Who here has some familiarity with NAFTA? Raise your hands. OK, that's good. Most of you do. Um, so just for those who, who didn't raise their hands, um, NAFTA was a trade deal unlike any other at its time. It was designed by corporations and for corporations. It caused devastation among working people and put profits over human lives and the environment. It undermined environmental and labor laws, and it allowed corporations to exploit people and the planet. In the United States, we see that our government puts profits over human lives. It puts corporations over people. Trade deals like NAFTA and the TPP put those ideas into other countries too. It forces those kinds of neoliberal ideas into other countries. So really quick note on the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the TPP. So the TPP um, was a trade deal amongst 12 Pacific Rim nations. Uh, it was still signed in the end, but not by the United States. The United States did not join. And that's not because of Donald Trump. It's primarily because of activists on the ground like you, who worked hard and secured no votes from members of Congress so that by the time Trump was elected, by the time the election happened, there weren't enough votes for the Trans-Pacific Partnership to pass in the United States. And that's why it didn't happen in the US. But the TPP was passed under the leadership of Canada. And so those 11 other nations are part of it. It's called the TPP-11. And it has even worse labor standards than the TPP would have had. So I think a lot of us are kind of hoping that administrations like the Trudeau administration are the folks that we turn to in times like this when we have such a you know, pro-multinational corporation government. But you know, Trudeau is a neoliberal. He's still pushing these kinds of policies that harm everyday working people and harm the environment. So. When Trump takes credit for defeating the TPP, he's taking credit for the work that working people did, which you know is his specialty, but still, it's, it's a lie when he says that. So in NAFTA renegotiations now, you guys have probably heard a lot of news stories. Um, we're facing the same corporate interests, and they've had unprecedented access to this administration. They've been put into positions of power, and they've had significant influence in these renegotiations. So when Donald Trump made his announcement a couple weeks ago uh, that the United States and Mexico had reached some kind of deal in principle, uh, it wasn't necessarily true that Canada was part of it. Canada has still you know, remained silent. And Canada is staying out, not because they ha they're holding to, their, to these ideals that we're pushing. Instead, Canada is staying out because they've been meeting with corporate lobbyists and Republican lawmakers who've just said, just wait out these talks, nothing will happen, we could keep the status quo of NAFTA. So every day we're going up against billions of dollars in lobbying money, but together we've been able to accomplish quite a bit. Trade is a populist issue, and it's a people's issue. Grassroots organizing and collaboration amongst movements is the key to bringing about change in these troubling times. So without further ado, I want to introduce our panelists here who are here to talk about how NAFTA impacted the environment and what we're looking to do to make changes in trade deals. So first off, I'd like to introduce Ted Lewis. He's the director of human rights programs at Global Exchange. He created a program of exchange and solidarity with Mexico's civil and human rights movements. In recent years, Ted has worked with Mexican organizations to end the murders, corruption, and impunity resulting from misguided drug policies designed in the United States, and he supported victims of the drug war in telling their stories. The, the ruling party, which had ruled Mexico since, you know, with one, one president after another since the 1930s, um, <clears throat> uh, it suddenly is really undermined. People are like, wait a minute, are they really looking out for our interests? We used to get, you know, uh, uh, you know meat, we used to get tortillas, we used to get all kinds of stuff. There, you know, the, everybody's economy, per, family economies are collapsing. The country is in, like, you know, a, a, extreme state of uh, hyperinflation, all kinds of things are going on. Um, 
It's joined by an earthquake in Mexico City, which further undermines confidence in the government. In 1988, there's an election. And in Mexico, elections up to that point had traditionally been just kind of like the one, the one president from that party comes, takes over, runs it for the next six years, hands it to the next one. They called it the Dedazo, you know, you, you, you point out the next, per, the next president. When 1988, the system urts, jerked to a halt because there was so much latent discontent among the population that they voted overwhelmingly to uh, elect a guy named Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas, who was the president of a former pres uh, uh, the son of a former president who was very popular, and he came out against the neoliberal, what we came to call the neoliberal policies that were being imposed on Mexico. That election was not allowed to come to its honest result. It was There was tremendous fraud. This was back during the end of the Reagan administration that this happened. The United States was complicit in that fraud. Millions of votes were, were shifted. Computer systems broke down. They didn't know what to do, but what they did know was that they wanted to put their guy in. And here's where the plot against the people of, of uh, North America was already well underway. During the, year, the, during the 1980s, there was a guy, the, the U.S. ambassador to Mexico was a guy named John Negroponte. Does that ring a bell to anyone? John Negroponte had an earlier incarnation being the U.S. ambassador to Honduras who organized the Contra War against revolutionary Nicaragua in the early 1980s. They took him out of action for a while, but when the crisis, the, democr the crisis of democracy, and the, the crisis for them was that democracy was getting out of hand and that people were actually going to have their demands, you know, met because they were going to push it. So they, so I, what, what happened then is that the U.S. ruling class, who was manipulating the Mexican ruling class, realized we've got to do something. We've got to, the, the, Democrat, the, democracy, the, the process of democracy in Mexico is inevitable. It, eventually, the people who represent the poor majority in Mexico are going to come to power. There's nothing we can do to stop that. But what we can do is capture the economy and internationalize it in a way that they can't take advantage of it once they're in power, that they will be locked out from being able to actually change the economy. And that's what NAFTA was all about. That's what John Negroponte came to Mexico as ambassador to do. He organized the background to NAFTA. They got a guy from who was a, a you know, prestigious graduate of, um, of Harvard University, a guy named Salinas de Gutari. They installed him as a technocrat in Mexico. They ran him against Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas, and when they lost, they're like, hey, too bad. We're putting our guy in anyway. He's the one, Salinas de Gortari, the fraudulently, you know, input, you know, imposter candidate is the one who negotiated the NAFTA agreement with the United States. So the agreement is is completely fraudulent from the very get-go. Uh, Salinas de Gortari, the fraudulently elected uh, president of Mexico, is the one who changed Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution, which had protected ajito lands, the Im tremendously important for this crowd, like the, perhaps the most important part about Mexico's land-owning structure. We had a panel yesterday, and someone cited the figure to me. Even now, after NAFTA, 55% of the land in Mexico belong, is publicly owned by communities, by indigenous communities, by campesino communities. This is an extremely important thing. But they, they organized, they, that was protected in the Constitution. Salinas de Gortari, in order to sign NAFTA, took that out of the, Constitu out of the Mexican Constitution. It's one of the crimes of that era that, you know, that continues and continues to, to be part of unraveling Mexican society. We all know what the reputation of Mexico is now. People are afraid to go to Mexico. Things are falling apart. There's a drug war there. And the drug, the, the, the changes that NAFTA brought about were extremely important for the drug trafficking industries, for these other industries to get a foothold in Mexico. The drug trafficking industries were also wrapped around the Salinas de Gortari family. Raul Salinas, the brother of uh, Carlos Salinas, the fraudulently you know, uh, imposed president of Mexico who negotiated NAFTA was also directly linked to the top levels. And this is not me making this up. You can look, you can Google this and it'll come up in a second. They were direct, directly linked. Raul Salinas, after, after the, their presidency was over, you know, the brother had hundreds of millions of dollars in Swiss bank accounts that he had gotten through taking money just for his own. And that's how politics was also organized in Mexico. These folks were putting the money in. So that's the Mexico, you know, those elites in Mexico are the ones who signed NAFTA as soon as NAFTA came in, 
people started to become billionaires, um, and Mexico's economy bottomed out tremendously. I went on a tour in 1996 with people from El Barzon, a debtors movement in Mexico, to say no, NAFTA didn't work, because what it did was it immediately took out the bottom of Mexico's economy. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Noemi, because she lived that experience as a young woman. My name is Noemi Aydetungui. I come from the Purepecha people of Michoacan, Mexico. Um, and up until recently, I started to learn about NAFTA and what that meant on a very human level. Um, I went out to North Dakota with the indigenous people um, and, and found out that indigenous people from all over the world were, were coming together to fight against things that were a result of NAFTA, such as more oil exports, more crude oil, um, and so forth. Um, and, and when we talk about NAFTA, I mean, there are so many different segments to it, but I think a lot of times what's left out is forced migration. Um, and so we need to bring that conversation up. Uh, so we passed out a form, a, a paper that has some facts um, written by Dr. Ann Lopez who um, is on another panel, uh, but she, she's an expert, and so that's something that is for you guys to take home. Um, when talking about NAFTA um, and talking about forced migration, um, we began to look at, um, so like in 2000, we were seeing that around three, three million people were migrating over from Mexico to the US. And a decade later, that number more than doubled. Um, my family, uh, myself, we were one of those uh, people who migrated here. Uh, my, fa my family were farmers, and so farmers were highly affected by the NAFTA deal, um, which now we're seeing uh, something that I want you to remember today is NAFTA 2.0, which is happening right now. It's being sneaked in in, in um, Washington, D.C., um, and we're unfortunately having to tackle other environmental things such as offshore drilling and so forth. Um, forced migration, we're seeing about it right now in the news with, I'm sure you've all seen the pictures of the caged children. Yes. Um, I was in uh, San Diego at one of the detention centers recently. I was out sleeping, um, camping outside the ICE detention um, center in LA. Um, I have family who are currently in detention centers. Um, I have family who were lost making their trip over from Mexico to the U.S. And these are things that we really need to humanize when we talk about a NAFTA deal. What does that really mean? What are the implications, not just to, um, on, on trade deals, on the economy, but on families? And what does that mean on, on a level of uh, generational trauma? So um, something that Ted mentioned here was about the violence. Um, I actually just recently went back to um, learn some of my indigenous language uh, a couple weeks ago to my hometown and uh, seeing that one of my cousins just got kid kidnapped by the drug lords. Um, again, humanizes NAFTA and what we're seeing from those effects. And it's important that we don't read about this decades from now, but that we talk about it happening now and have these really uncomfortable conversations, right? Um, uh, something that NAFTA also did was um, it, it brought a lot of disease to the countries where it was um, implied to. So like in Mexico, um, I forget the year, there was something considered the swine flu, yeah. because um, so some of you have heard about it. Yeah, so, so what NAFTA's doing is um, bringing diseases to those countries um, and, and um, making tariffs go up, making, um, bringing a lot of um, unhealthy, unhealthiness to those communities who previously were you know, farming corn, um, uh, non-GMO, and now um, we're seeing like high rates of diabetes because of the junk food labels and what NAFTA is doing to that. Um, uh, yeah, I was just at, um, at this, in March, I gathered with about 6,000 women from around the world to join 
uh, at the Zapatista camp in um, Chiapas. And um, the women there, so, so when we talk about what, what happened with NAFTA and how we got to it and what's happening, we also have to talk about solutions and revolutions and what's happening on the ground. Um, so I don't want to make it all negative. I want to talk about what I've seen also, um, the, the beauty in, in these indigenous communities fighting back. Um, we, it was the first national, um, um, international gathering of women who struggle. And uh, because women have this deep connection with Mother Earth, right? We, we give birth, we're able to give birth. Uh, um, we had a gathering with indigenous women from different indigenous groups from all over the globe um, to talk about solutions, to talk about what neoliberalism is doing to their countries, to Argentina, Brazil, Denmark, um, everywhere. What, what's happening because of these trade deals, what's happening because of these migrations, because of these um, because of greedy corporations and greedy governments making deals without the input of the communities, um, which again I want to highlight when we talk about NAFTA, it's very undemocratic. Um, countries, uh, NAFTA gets to sue countries um, uh, because of, of uh, when countries try to fight against NAFTA and human rights and so forth. Um, so these communities are fighting back, and that was one of the things I got to see in Chiapas, um, to, to see, uh, get uh, workshops from these indigenous women and see how they're, um, how they're uh, unlearning a lot of the, the things that, <laughs> that we've been taught and, and relearning because, uh, believe it or not, despite you know, the common misconception that America is the greatest country in the world. Not everybody wants to come here. Um, and uh, a lot of people are unfortunately forced to come here. Um, that includes, again, as I mentioned, my family, um, my father who came here before I was born and during my early childhood to work in the farm fields to make sure that, uh, again, it's this better, searching for a better world but, um, but this better future without knowing that the government actually, it was a direct result of, of um, these trade deals. Um, so, uh, yeah. I want to thank our panelists. I'm going to say a couple things and I'll open it up to questions because um, I want this to be a conversation. I want to hear uh, your thoughts and your questions about what's going on with that. So, Q if you. Uh, a few key points to take away. So these victories that we've had over these pipelines and uh, the oil industry and, and other industries that seek to exploit the planet, um, they're huge victories and they're victories that are people driven. Um, but while NAFTA is still in place, while you still have things like the investor state dispute settlement system, these victories are still just temporary. They can be overridden because under NAFTA, under the industrial state dispute settlement system, uh, a multinational corporation could you know, maybe lose their, their pipeline or something, but they could sue for unlimited sums of money based on expected future loss of profit. They could sue for $15 billion, is what I was saying. Um, they could sue for more. So what we have to do is we have to demand to our elected officials that they push for a NAFTA that doesn't have the investor state dispute settlement system that we have to push for a NAFTA that has strong and enforceable labor and environmental standards. And what Noemi highlighted is something that I think is incredibly important in this work, and that's that human beings are affected by this. These are human lives. These are lives at stake when, it, when, that, when trade deals like this are discussed. It's not some wonky issue. It's an issue that affects all of us. And, you know, I, I had, after college, I, I did some work on the Sanders campaign, and that was the first time I really saw the impact of NAFTA. I visited communities that had been absolutely devastated because their jobs had been shipped to another country where people were making slave wages. Um, I saw entire, like, just ghost towns, and I saw people tell me the stories of their town with a little bit of pride and also with a lot of sadness, and that, that really stuck with me. 
fact that you know, people are impacted, people in this country, people in Mexico, people in Canada, people in countries all over the world are impacted uh, negatively by these trade agreements, these neoliberal trade agreements. So the negotiations are still happening. Uh, even though Trump says that there's some kind of deal in writing, it's still not there because you do want Canada to be part of a deal, or otherwise it's not really NAFTA. So the only folks who have seen a little bit of the text are our partners in labor, our partners in the labor movement. Some of them have been meeting with the uh, Trump administration to try to get across the points that they need to see for working people. And what they've said from what they've seen is that it's the labor chapters are nowhere near where they need to be to help working families in this country. And so a lot of people are going to come from this panel thinking like, oh, maybe there's nothing I can do. But the negotiations have moved significantly to the left in some issues. There's still a lot more progress to be made. And another thing that we've done this year is we've gotten a lot of Democrats to take positions on trade that they wouldn't have taken a couple of years ago during the TPP days. They've taken stronger positions against these neoliberal trade deals. So it's important when you come to something like this to follow up with your representatives, to speak out, and uh, to stay informed. So I do have this sign-up form here. Uh, for those of you who are interested in receiving email updates or alerts, uh, you'll probably get an email from me about a petition that's going out. Um, right now we have over 150,000 signatures on it um, and counting. And that petition will be delivered in DC by some of our champions uh, in the Senate. So. Uh, yeah, with, without further ado, I think that I will open it up to questions if folks have questions. Yes? I just had a question. You know, there was a lot of stuff in the news about the pressure that Trump was putting on the Canadians to sign on to the deal by the end of the week mm -hmm. yeah. so that they could introduce it because they want to have Congress ratify it so that it could get signed before the, um, the current Mexican administration leaves and Lopez Obrador assumes office December 1. Yes. But what's happened with that whole time frame? Is it, uh, will they meet that, or is it now going to land in the Lopez Obrador administration? So they could still meet it. It's still possible that they meet that time frame. Um, I think that Canada is trying to, it's interesting, Canada is actually finding it really hard to keep the investor state dispute settlement system in there. It's something that we've been able to push the Trump administration and Mexico to, to try to get rid of. But uh, Canada is trying to keep it in there, even though Canada is the most sued country under ISDS. Um, so negotiations are still still going on. Um, we don't really know uh, whether or not they'll have have a deal. Um, it seems like Canada is kind of going back and forth with deciding whether or not to do it. If they do announce that they have some kind of deal in principle, and they do deliver the text uh, to Congress, Congress will have only a certain amount of time to, to agree to it. And what Trump's likely going to do in that case is threaten to withdraw from NAFTA. Or they sign, or sign the new deal. So either you sign the new deal, or I'm going to withdraw from NAFTA. Um, and I think it's important that uh, since it's likely the deal will not have the strong and enforceable labor and environmental standards we've been pushing for, um, that Congress calls a bluff, um, and that you know, we fight really hard to make sure that we don't accept a deal that will hurt working people in the environment more than it already has. So, other questions? Yes? Yeah. Um, so I'm just recently learning about a little more detail about NAFTA besides what you usually hear that it's, it's Can you bad. speak up? Um, so I'm just learning about NAFTA. Um, trying to get in more depth about um, beyond that it's bad for the uh, people and the earth. So what is specifically the incentive for, um, for Mexico? Is it, is it something beyond just politicians maybe have stock options in these companies? Do we have any um, information on what the incentive is? The, the thing that you know, the pro-NAFTA people talk about the most is direct investment. Um, and that, that is, you know, when, when they're defending the gains of NAFTA, it's always about direct investment. They don't look at, you know, quality of life indicators and those kind of things. 
Um, but the direct investment is what creates, I, I you know, slid right over it, but the creation of the billionaire class in Mexico um, you know, had a lot to do with the tremendous privatization process that had happened to Mexico's uh, economy. So for the, for the people who are at the very top, you know, we now think of them as the one percenters or the one-tenth of one percent. In the case of Mexico, I'm really talking about one-tenth of one percent. They saw the possibility of NAFTA making them, taking them from being just kind of upper class to becoming ultra wealthy and being able to play at a global level. So that one, that upper upper crust in Mexico wants to play in the global economy, and that's what they've been putting forward. So they sold along with NAFTA, and this is what Carlos Salinas did, you know, for the Bush administration, the people who want to do that. They sold the idea that. Everybody in Mexico is going to benefit by our integration with the global economy. And if you don't do it, we're going to be passing up the opportunity and, you know, China and this and that, you know, putting up all the competition. So the incentive has been for the billionaire class that they get to become those, real, really become those billionaires and have those kind of, you know, huge amounts of money. And the, for, for most other people in Mexico, um, <clears throat> You know, swaths of the middle class have benefited, some have gained, some have lost. That's one of the, you know, things that they'd like to say about it. But most of the benefits were imaginary. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just quickly add, um, over the course of NAFTA, we've also seen, you know, two million Mexican farmers lost their jobs um, since NAFTA was enacted, um, which Noemi was talking about some and how her family was impacted by that. A lot of that, so the two processes that happened out of, two of the processes that happened out of that were the forced migration um, that Noemi talked about, and then the other part going into manufacturing jobs in Mexico, right? Um, and so that's another narrative around NAFTA, of, of pro-NAFTA, is that it increased manufacturing and production in Mexico. What isn't talked about is that Mexico actually has way lower, I mean, they have higher labor standards written into their legislation, but when it's actually put into place, um, Mexican, I, I believe the average wage of a Mexican manufacturing worker is $3 a day, which is less than in China, right? So it's really terrible standards, not to mention, you know, people being fired for trying to unionize, physical force against worker organizing, you know, there's a lot around that. Um, but in terms of one of the pro uh, NAFTA narratives is around manufacturing in Mexico. As and that's where that foreign investment goes, is right. to, for that. And that's the billionaire class that's controlling right. that manufacturing, right? So, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for an excellent talk. I, I wanted to add one clarification. I think it's Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution says that any foreign treaty has priority above the Constitution itself, and that's what gives them power that not even the president or the Senate can fight it. If we've signed a treaty, it's corporatocracy rules above democracy. That's a great point. Yes, great point. You had a question? Sí, voy a hablar en español. Qué bueno que ustedes saben la historia. Estos tratados como NAFTA y otros tratados que han hecho con todos los países de Latinoamérica, Sudamérica, lo que dijo ella, que lo que hacen es eh, favorecen a un grupo, a las corporaciones. Es por eso hay mucha inmigración de los países latinoamericanos para acá. Porque lo que dijo usted, acaba de mencionar usted, que gana tres dólares el día y el costo de vida está caro. Y es, es triste, pero ojalá que haya más organizaciones que luchen por eso, porque de verdad que sí, en muchas comunidades, en todos los países del sur, los latinoamericanos, sufren esa consecuencia. Entonces, y lamentablemente, podemos decir, eh, mi gente, no, bueno, algunos no se informan de lo que pasa, la, como el NAFTA y otros tratados que han hecho en la historia. Y, y lamentablemente, eh, muchos venimos aquí. A sufrir. Que le Muchas... que... Sí, sí, adelante. Okay. Uh, it, it's too much for me to do it. Uh, thank you for telling this story. 
Um, it's, it's very important to understand that for these reasons, throughout Latin America, people have, have had to leave their countries. They've been, they've been forced to travel to the United States. That's why a lot of people are here. Um, it's very important that there's organizations uh, working on this. It's, it's lamentable, this situation, but it's important that there's organizations working on it. Are you going to make a album us? Sí. Uh, sí. ¿Qué fue la última parte también que dijo? Hola, bueno, los tratados que hacen, hace, usted comentó que por eso muchos de nuestra gente se vienen a buscar trabajo allá, porque los pagos allá son baratos, no alcanza para, 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 para vivir, solo para sobrevivir especialmente. Eh, las familias que tienen, ya ve que los, las personas, ya ve que nuestros países todavía están atrasados, personas que tienen cuatro, cinco, seis hijos. Por eso la inmigración se viene para acá, por esos tratados. Yeah, he, he was saying, uh, you know, thank you for sharing about um, how it's really corporations that are, um, uh, it, it's uh, because of greedy corporations that there's this forced migration. Um, and then people in Mexico, they're, um, they can barely afford to, to live. Right now, um, I'll, I'll add on that right now, the dollar um, over there, you get it for like, it's like 18, 18 pesos to the dollar. Um, the people over there are devastated. The, 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 the currency is, is just really, it, it's almost impossible to live there right now, especially when we talk about the indigenous community where they rely on like a lot of like um, Coca-Cola and a lot of these different um, corporations coming into their communities. And um, with, with, when you add on like the drug trafficking and all of that, um, these, a lot of communities shut down their, uh, as a form of protest, they shut down the streets and they don't allow these corporations to come in because they know that um, they can actually get national, they could actually get their legislators to pay attention to those indigenous communities if they shut down exports and imports from going into their little communities. So you're seeing that across Mexican communities right now. Um, you'll, if you drive through, you'll see different communities. They're tired of it. Um, and, and so um, they're, they're um, fighting against um, not just like the drug trafficking, but the, the government and, and these trade deals, a result of these trade deals. And another thing that, sorry, uh, just one more thing I want to add on about the um, San Francisco Living Wage Coalition, which is another group you guys should check out locally. They do trips out to um, Juarez, and um, some of what they've seen when they visit is again how you mentioned about how women get paid like three dollars and these are a lot of it is women working at these manufacturing companies for American um, corporations like Tesla so when we talk about a just transition we need to really identify who is it just for who who's who it's not a just transition it's an unjust just transition so we need to identify that as well um, because Tesla is supposed to be move us towards right like greener but at whose expense and so the women who are working in the maquiladoras in these uh, factories in Juarez near the border they're working under the worst conditions seen anywhere else um, there are a lot of widowed women single women uh, um, uh, single mothers um, a lot of them who do get kidnapped and murdered um, happens a lot and uh, recently hundreds of them uh, who were in direct contact with the groups here um, tried to unionize and hundreds got fired. Um, yeah. Another piece that I think he added as well was just sort of the way that all of these stories tie together, right? It's not just NAFTA and the economic boom and all of the, you know, um, financial stuff that came with it, but also the human impacts, also the migration, right? It's sort of that secondary piece that then also leads into, you know, migrant farm workers and the farm system we have in the United States, right? And so it's like, what stories are we telling and how are they all connected? And also to Noemi's point of, you know, what an envi a sustainable environmental future looks like um, and where we're going is, you know, when we look for uh, an equitable, renewable future, what we can see right now, what's happening behind the scenes, right? And who are the people who are manufacturing the pieces for our Tesla cars, right? Where are those batteries coming from in, you know, indigenous communities in Chile? I was speaking to someone yesterday who was talking about that. And so it's, 
really recognizing all of trying to piece all the parts of the puzzle together. Um, y bueno, pienso que también dijiste que hay muchas historias en sí. Latinoamérica que sí, son los que se han hecho, han con afectado. Sí, que eso es not just in Mexico. Hay muchos tratados que han hecho como nada. Yeah. There's sí, CAFTA. Sí, hay muchos. Sí. Yeah, there's a lot of treaties um, that are happening all over Latin America, not just NAFTA, that have sort of led to this. I don't know if you're familiar with Beehive Collective, um, but they have an amazing poster and a visual um, storytelling um, that I would highly recommend you check out. Beehive Collective, there's a poster called Mesoamerica Resiste um, that took 10 years to do that's all based on um, stories of resistance uh, and imposition in Latino America. Question, which has to do with why are progressives not just going with Trump and saying blow up NAFTA? Why are we trying to change something we don't want? So I think in, in this case, when, when Trump talked about NAFTA on the campaign trail and when he talked about it, when he talks about it now, he doesn't identify the actual problem. He says that Mexico somehow hoodwinked the United States or Canada hoodwinked the United States and they're exploiting. But what is actually happening is it's these multinational corporations, the 1%, who are exploiting people. So he's not even addressing the source of the problem. Um, a lot of the solutions that he's proposed are kind of have solutions. They're not really um, you know, solutions designed to help working people. And so what we're doing is instead of saying, like, necessarily you know, destroy NAFTA, we want there to be some kind of trade agreement that actually has strong and enforceable labor and environmental standards. Um, because that's that's what will actually help people. Um, destroying NAFTA might not necessarily do that. And so we want something that moves uh, the ball forward quite a bit. And so that's why you see people like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, um, and other folks kind of endorsing our message on NAFTA. And this has been something that's been pushed for a long time since NAFTA started. My organization, our national organization, Citizen Straight Campaign, was started to oppose NAFTA in the 90s. Um, I was like three years old when it was started, but uh, it's been a long fight and we're getting a lot further. So I think the important thing is to elevate the conversation and to talk about the real people who are uh, benefiting from this and you know, highlight the fact that we're all in this together, like working people, um, ordinary people from the U.S. and from Mexico and from Canada, they're, we're the ones who, you know, whose lives are at stake is these trade deals. Um, and you know, Trump never addresses, addresses it now. Yes? Um, so just a quick question. The farmers who own land in Mexico, um, I know that farm workers here in the U.S. are not necessarily, who are ne necessarily farmers in Mexico, although some of them are. Is the issue um, land grabbing and or is it also that the farmers themselves cannot make a living as they used to because maybe the prices of food are, are, are just too expensive for people to afford um, or is it a little bit of both? Um, why are actually farmers specifically um, migrating or having to now take on other jobs and is are people actually are they actually taking their land was it maybe a, a land in common in which they didn't have title to the land? Great question. So with the ejidos, which is the collective land holding system, people were not, by the change in the Constitution, required to disband. But what it gave them the opportunity to do was, previously that land was held as a community. Okay. And if the community, for some reason, breaks up, <clears throat> then the land can be now can now be sold off and so people can benefit from that. The concern, the fear by the opponents of NAFTA, among them me, was <clears throat> that, that that was going to happen. What we saw was exactly what you said, point number one, that the economic model changed. You start having imports of corn, flour, other commodities to Mexico that undercut the, the ability of indigenous farmers and small farmers to create a product that could go to market. So you got undercut by capitalism. The fear was, and I think the plan was honestly, that when that happened, people would abandon the land, they'd sell off, and then large agriculture could come in and return it like it was before the Mexican Revolution. That has not happened. 
That has not happened to the, nearly the degree that we feared that it would. Um, it's not that it's not that it's a zero phenomenon, but but the ejido system is one of the strongest cultural heritages that Mexico has. And like Noemi is saying, it's one of the it's it's what the ejido. It's a E J I D O. It's a specific word that comes from the you know from Nahuatl um, to, to describe this uh, kind of holding. So this is a very uh, you know hopeful sign that people haven't actually broken the ejido like the piggy bank that you know that the neoliberals wanted them to. And you know there's there I, I want to make sure that we don't end with people feeling you know devastated because what we've just witnessed in Mexico in the last few months is a, a, what is no less than an electoral revolution. The, their, we don't know exactly what the new government is going to do, but what we do know that this is the most significant shift that has happened in Mexico in the entire you know, 20th century and, and you know, th since the colony in, in, terms of, in terms of this is a, a shift um, that that electorally speaking is gonna is gonna mean a lot. I shouldn't say since the colony, the revolution, whatever. But the <clears throat> the vote in the last election was an overwhelming vote. So much so, I, I, I have observed elections in Mexico now for about 24 years. On you know like a bunches of elections, and the manipulation of the Mexican public has been extreme. It makes what we used to have in the United States look like you know. Uh, um, you know, a uh, almost you know the, the the level of monopoly of information in Mexico in the early '90s was was a hundred percent coming from the government. You could barely get a word out edgewise if you tried to have a a, a guerrilla broadcast. You know, one of those one of those uh, radios with a hundred hundred watts or something. The military would be right on you. So. Now it's really opened up in a lot of ways, very much to the commercial side. So our fear was that now the elections are opened up, they'll just go to the American style elections where you're manipulated by the big, the big money, by the, by the advertising now, by the internet, and that that was gonna lock people's brains down because no one would be able to compete. But that's not what's happened. What we saw in this election, last election was 53% of the Mexican electorate came out and voted for a guy who's been in the opposition, who's struggled for the last, uh, you know, many, many years. I met Lopez Obrador down in his home state of Tabasco when he was leading and part of uh, protests to try and uh, force the National Oil Company to respect the rights of the indigenous people whose lands were being despoiled by, by the oil industry. Will he keep that up? Will he, as president, carry that tradition forward? Well, we certainly hope so. I just got a, a text right before the meeting, uh, the, this, this panel, uh, of a, from a friend of mine who actually took me down to Tabasco to meet Lopez Obrador back in, in um, 1996. She just got appointed to be the director of social development for the entire country. She's a, a woman of impeccable character. So these kind of things make me feel like there's some room to go here. It's the kind of situation where people are gonna to have to go ahead with their eyes open, but we've just seen a democratic transformation in Mexico. The ruling party, the party that ruled Mexico for over 80 years, you know, with one short break, um, they only got 13.5% of the vote nationally. They did not win in a single precinct in the entire country. There was nowhere where the old ruling party actually won. So it's a, it's a sea change, and it's something that we need to think about here in this country because a lot of people here have put elections and voting as like, oh, that'll never get us anywhere. Oh, that's just like letting them win the game. Well, letting them win the game is like, is abandoning that process because frankly, it's one of the last weapons that we have and we've got to take advantage of it. You know, we can go out in the street in all our numbers, we can do that, but if we don't vote, we are just abandoning the, 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 the territory. So, you know, I, I don't know uh, if Will has more to say on that, but that's... I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, I do know that... Um, so what happened in Mexico, we can picture, like, let's say the Peace and Freedom Party um, just grew, or, or we even started a new party and we got somebody there elected. Can we imagine not having somebody from the Republican or Democratic Party become president. That, that, that's what Mexico did. Um, and it's, it's mind blowing. I mean, there was a tiny earthquake from the people jumping up of joy in Mexico um, <laughs> when, when um, they announced the winner um, in, in the 
Basilica in, in Mexico City. Um, another uh, person who ran in Mexico who didn't get as much attention, um, she's a, a, an indigenous woman. Um, whose name I'm thinking? Marichui. Marichui. I actually got to see her in March uh, of this year in Chiapas. She's an indigenous woman. She's not a Zapatista woman, but she, the Zapatistas, although they are non-political, they did go and endorse her and and um, basically um, went campaigning with her. Um, the car that she was in actually got shot a few days, uh, uh, a couple months ago now, um, near the border, and they killed the woman that she was traveling with. So there is still this like fight once a lot of sexism. Um, a lot of anti-indigenous people, both sides of the border, um, right? Um, but uh, she, but she did raise a huge amount of people who, uh, of indigenous people who were not involved in the political process. I mean, the I don't know the exact number, but I saw a video of like just you could see over the mountain indigenous people from all over Mexico coming to greet her. She was the face of the indigenous people, and so that that is still happening. That's still being cultivated in Mexico. So that so when we've elected somebody uh, like um, Lopez, Obrador. Lopez Obrador, now we can even begin to to have conversations about electing an indigenous woman, um, which is huge. It's huge. It's revolutionary. And I'll just very quickly add one more. No, sh sorry, to clarify. Uh, the woman she was in the car with, uh, who was campaigning with her, was killed. And Marichui was hurt uh, when I saw her. I think she had a cast on. But, but she won the election. She didn't win the, the election to become president, but she did run. And she did wake up this whole group of indigenous people who were not involved in the political process. Um, so that's huge. Just one more quick indigenous win, um, also relating back to your question about farm workers. Um, a large piece that uh, Ted already spoke to some was the, the big industry coming in, right? Especially corporations like Monsanto coming in and flooding the corn market. Um, and one, another big win that just happened, I think, in the last year, um, was a group of indigenous women um, had been had filed a suit against Monsanto. Uh, for coming in because they were, he, they were, Monsanto was saying they couldn't use their traditional seeds, right? Um, and they won the suit um, so that they're able to continue planting and using their traditional ecological knowledge um, to maintain their traditions. So there are wins happening, and I think a lot of it is coming from indigenous communities in Mexico, which I think is revolutionary, um, and that it's happening both within the court system and outside in um, in the electoral system and on the ground. So just want to add that. Way.